Hey, and welcome back to guillotined 18th century chemist theater, gases. Um, gases, a really neat part of chemistry. Conceptually very easy, uh, but it does bring home a lot of big ideas. In fact, a lot of early chemistry was done studying gases. All the, all the big players, Dalton, Boyle, Lavoisier, all these people studied gases. Um, and so what we're going to do today is introduce uh, the kinetic molecular theory that backs up our idea of gases, define some things about ideal gases, and then talk about some properties to measure gases. And then we'll get to, into all the good stuff very soon. Um, so our new uh, co-host, of course, uh, would make sense. An elephant in a gas mask make a lot of sense here. Um, so what do you probably already know about gases? You probably already know that gases are the state of matter with a variable shape and a variable volume. Unlike solids that are defined shape and volume and liquids that are defined uh, volume but not shape. That's why crazy straws are so much fun. Um, and so they easily conform to the shape of any container within reason. So you could take all the gas in the room you're in and compress it down to a shoebox, and you could take all the gas in a shoebox and let it expand out to the size of the room and, and even further. And, and this is because, again, there's giant space between the atoms or molecules, and that can adjust depending on the space available. Um, so that's, that's going to lead us to the idea of the kinetic molecular theory. Now, KMT is a great example of a theory. We're trying to explain what we see. And so we have a model of the atom, um, the idea of a kinetic molecular theory, where the model of a gas is something called an ideal gas. Um, now, there is no such thing as an ideal gas, as we'll see from the first principle of ideal gas, i.e. that they're tiny, so tiny that they have uh, no volume and take up no space. Now, right off the bat, of course, that eliminates all gases. <laughs> but for the sake of modeling gases, um, the ideal gas is a pretty great w place to be. And so an ideal gas would be tiny. It would take up no space. It would have rapid random motion, uh, meaning they'd run in a straight line until they hit something, and then they'd bounce off and run off in a, a new direction. And this happens, of course, very quickly in the real world. So they don't get very far before they bang off into something. But this would be akin to you you know, putting on a blindfold and starting to run. Uh, I do not encourage you to do that. But then you'd hit something, and then you immediately uh, start running in a different direction, um, which means that all your collisions would be elastic. So no matter how fast you're running, when you hit something, you'd immediately be going in a different direction that fast again. And so that's, again, for your, you physics fans out there, that's considered an elastic collision. Uh, meaning no energy is lost when it hits something. An inelastic collision is when it hits something, there's usually a deformation or something like that, and energy is absorbed. Um, so like when you back a car into a telephone pole, uh, that's usually not an elastic collision unless it was a bumper car. Uh, kinetic energy of gases is proportional to temperature, but it's the temperature in Kelvin. And this is one of the huge mistakes of gases from beginning to end, and we'll harp on this the whole time, you must put your temperature in an absolute scale. If you measure your temperature in a scale that can go into the negatives, it will not work for gas laws. And we'll show you why more later. Now, the only real absolute temperature scale that anybody's familiar with is the Kelvin scale, and that's why we'll go with that. And an ideal gas would never condense. Um, real gases can condense. You've all seen liquefied uh, natural gas and things like that. Uh, but an ideal gas, no matter what the pressure, what the temperature, would never condense. And so you can't get an ideal gas anywhere. It doesn't exist. Uh, but the reasons it's useful is that most gases act like an ideal gas under most conditions. Just like students. Uh, most students act like an ideal student most of the time. Uh, you know, kind of like, wow, what would I picture a perfect student to be? And most students are an ideal most of the time. But if you put a student under a lot of pressure, like time constraints and things like that, they might start acting less than ideal. Um, not you, uh, but other students. And the same thing goes for gases. Most gases uh, will act pretty ideal most of the time. But when you start putting them on a lot of pressure um, or change the temperature, um, they might start acting less than ideal. And so what we can do is talk about some of the variables we can measure for any gas. And for the rest of the unit, you're going to see these brought up again and again and again in all the different laws. And so temperature is important for gases. Um, again, we measure temperature in the Kelvin system. You must remember to do that. You cannot measure temperature in anything else. Okay. Now, typically speaking, and this gets into some gas laws that we won't touch at this level, but typically lower temperatures mean lower speeds. And, and there are gas laws that talk about that. Um, by the way, and because I have nowhere else to put this in this unit, heavier gases also tend to move slower. That's uh, Graham's law of effusion. But again, that's, that's something for advanced 
uh, learners to pick up. But anyway, temperature is super important. Uh, quantity is super important, and the quantity is measured in N, and N is always considered moles. Um, and this is a great segue into stoichiometry, uh, because once you have N, once you have the number of moles, then you can roll it into stoichiometry, or vice versa. A lot of times, uh, you might find, up, find out something with stoichiometry and then roll it into a gas law. But anyway, uh, so if you're given the mass of a gas, uh, most times you're going to end up changing that into moles so that we can look at it. Um, and Avogadro had a lot to do with that. We'll be getting back to Avogadro later in this unit. Volume is important. How much space is that gas taking up? Now you might say, well, wait a minute, gases can have variable volume. That's true, but under any set of conditions, they're going to have a defined volume. So under given pressure and temperature, it'll be a defined volume. Um, there's lots of ways to measure volume. Uh, one of the nice ways we can do it is water displacement, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later too. Uh, but nonetheless, no matter what you measure it in, it could be liters, it could be milliliters, uh, cubic centimeters, cubic meters, whatever. Um, you do have a lot more flexibility with volume in gases, so that'll be nice. Or confusing, depending on your perspective. <laughs> and don't forget, uh, a, a handy conversion that, that you might use a lot is the idea that uh, one milliliter equals one cubic centimeter, or one cc as they say. Now the final unit, which we're going to actually talk a lot more about next time, is my favorite, and that's pressure. Um, pressure is essentially a force, a push or a pull over an area. Um, and the sum of the forces on a surface is considered the pressure of a gas. So if you had your kinetic molecular theory game where you had a bandana on or a blindfold on and you're running around, every time you hit the wall you would exert a force. And if there was a lot of you running around inside of a container, you'd all be hitting different walls and pushing against the side of the container. And that's exactly what gases do. Every time a molecule or an atom bangs into the side of the container, it pushes that container. So when you put air into a balloon, that's what keeps the balloon inflated, are the molecules inside bouncing against that. And so if, with that in mind, pressure makes a lot of sense. And so pressure is going to be proportional to the number of collisions, just like inside a balloon. Uh, or a crash, uh, or a, uh, you can think of a like a demolition derby. So if you have a demolition derby, anything that you can do to increase the number of collisions is going to increase the pressure. So what could you do to increase the number of collisions? All right. Well, think about it. Think of a demolition derby. What are what are some ways that you could do that? All right. Well, you could put everybody in a smaller arena, right? If there was less room for the cars, things would be colliding a lot more often with each other or the sides of the container. All right. You could increase the temperature of a system for gases, which would be the equivalent of making the cars move faster. right? If you're running faster, you're going to hit the wall more often. And then you could put more gas in there too. All right? And that's the same thing goes for a balloon. All right? If you compress a balloon, the pressure inside that balloon is going to go up. If you heat up a balloon, the pressure inside that balloon is going to go up. And if you uh, put more gas inside that balloon, the pressure is going to go up. Now again, volume can shift around with the balloon, but that, but again, you, 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 that's the beauty of gases. Is a lot of this stuff is is common sense, and so we're going to talk a lot more about the ramifications of pressure next time. And so we'll see if anybody gets this uh, this pressure reference here. Yeah. So, <laughs> I'll leave you to puzzle that pressure reference and see if you get that or not. Uh, but anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, looking forward to this unit with gases with you. And uh, have a great day.